All right, now in uh, the book of Ruth here, chapter number one. I'm going to kind of do a brief overview, and then um, we'll come back. There's actually a few, a few concepts that I want to cover from this story, um, more so than just the, the individual verse by verse. So basically what happens here, in chapter number one, the story goes, like in verse number one, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So this, this is happening in history back when God ordained judges to rule the land. Now, this was God's original plan. When, um, when God appeared unto Moses, he gave him the law. You know, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those are all called the books of Moses. Moses was the one that wrote down all you know the, the, the words in those books. Obviously, they come from God. Moses is the one that wrote them down. They're called the books of Moses or the law of Moses. God is, had, had revealed unto man all of these laws and had given it to us now where we could have it in a written format. Um, it's not that God's law never existed prior to that. But, um, you know, men of God would preach God's word, but we, they didn't have it just written down like in a book, which at, with Moses they did. Okay, now these laws were all laid out in the way that God, God, basically the way that God's government should work and the way that our human government, the way he designed our human government to work is that God is the king and we serve God. We serve God the king. So because God is the king, he makes the rules. He's the one that determines what is right and what is wrong. See, today we have a lot of different forms of government all throughout the world. We have, you know, in the United States, we have a, a democratic republic where, where people are, are voted in and supposedly they're supposed to represent the, a, a large group of people and, and they make the laws that way. And um, it's not a horrible form of government. I mean, it's definitely not the worst one. But it's not the one that God had designed either. See, the one that God designed, and this is what happened in the book in the in um, the time of the judges. You know, there's a book of the Bible called Judges, and it's right before this book of Ruth, and it explains how there were judges. Basically, God's the lawgiver, and He gave the law to Moses. Right? It's written down. We know what God's rules are. We know what His laws are. He said not to kill, not to steal, right? Not to bear false witness, not to commit adultery, and and, and so many others. There's so many other laws that He's given to us, but it's really not that much. I mean, it's really a, a short amount of laws that God has given for us to follow, especially in comparison to the laws that are on the books today. I don't think there's a person in the world that knows every single law that's in existence in our country today. There's, there's just way too many. There's so many laws upon laws upon laws upon laws. Look, and people think that God is so, you know, so hard and so mean and, oh man, you got these rules for us to follow. Compare that to the government of today, it, there's hardly any rules. Now, his rules make sense too, right? I mean, killing, stealing, basically not harming or violating other people. Essentially, that's how his laws are wrapped up. It's, it's two main commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy might. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Basically, you could boil down all of the laws that God gave unto those, those two principles. So one, and that's why he said, you, you know, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or bow down to them or, you know, serve any other gods. Well, that's because you need to be serving God with all your heart. So that was part of God's laws, not to be, not to be messing around with idolatry and other gods. And then the other part, treating your neighbor as yourself, you wouldn't want to be killed. You wouldn't want to be stolen from, you know, all these things. If you treat people in that manner, you're basically fulfilling God's laws, what he's saying. Um, and that's the way that he laid it out. So he's got these laws. He has these rules. And he knew that we needed to have people to help judge or determine what is right and what is wrong in different situations, right? Situations come up. And what do, you, what do you do when one person says one thing and another one says something else? What do you do when someone says, hey... You know, this person stole from me and that person says, no, we didn't, right? That's why you have judges. And God ordained there to be judges, people who knew God's law, people who had wisdom, people who had knowledge that could discern these things, that can look through it. They could sort through the evidence. They could, you know, people present their case. And God even, this, you know, describes 
um, what's necessary basically to hold to, to convict somebody you know if especially if it's a murder or something like that you need to have two or three witnesses to say that it can't be ever just one person saying that you can never convict somebody because there was a death penalty on that and God God laid out these are the punishments you know these are the laws these are the punishments and this is how you do it you're gonna have judges and that's it and the judges are just gonna help to interpret my laws to help for the understanding and especially with some of the harder cases where, where it seems a little bit gray, well, the judges are there to, to help determine what is righteous and what is true and what is just. That was what their role was. God never designed there to be, you know, an earthly king or any other form of government other than his law and judges. That is the perfect law. That is the perfect. And I had, it's funny, I had a discussion with this. We went to the, to the parade in Prescott Valley on, um, what was it, last week? It was the Prescott Valley days, so we went there, we were out the girls, and as soon as we get there, you know, sit down, and we're just there to have a good time, and some politicians coming up, you know, they're walking up and down, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm running for some, I'm just like, okay, yeah, you know, I was, I'm like, I don't vote, but that's another story, and uh, he's trying to talk to me, and I said, I don't believe in, you know, the government stealing from us and call it taxes, and you just go ahead and, you know, you guys are paying for a bunch of stuff I don't believe in, and you're just taking my money from me. I was having this whole discussion, I'm not, I don't want to get too political tonight, but, um, I'm just kind of explaining how the book of Judges works. And I was explaining to this guy how, you know, what I'm striving for and what I'm trying to do is like, oh, we're never going to have that. And I say, well, look, this is what I'm pushing for because I'm not going to settle for anything less. I, I mean, obviously, I'm stuck where I am. We have what we have. But if I'm going to work towards anything, I'm not going to work and, and just keep voting you, you bozos in to just, to just keep on stealing from me and keep on doing the things that you've been doing. It's not working very well. I'm going to strive to convince people to, to get back to God's ways because His ways are the right way. His ways are the perfect ways. Now, will it ever be like this in our lifetime? Probably not, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to try and I'm not going to push, push as much as possible to get things to be that way because it's the right way. I'm not going to, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to back down. God ordained us to have judges in His law. If we would just obey His law and just, and just do things that way, we would be in so much, we have so much more freedom. We'd be so much better off. And um, I, anyways, we'll get, I'm going to get off that subject right now because we're only on verse number one of Ruth 1. This is the time frame that this whole story is taking place. It's taking place during the time of the judges. Um, before any kings ruled, before King David, before King Saul, before all these other kings happened throughout the nation of Israel. It was when the judges ruled. And then it says there was a famine in the land. So they're in the land of Israel, right? God had, they had already gotten into the promised land. You know, Moses or Joshua led them in and, um, and they had fought all their battles. They fought their wars. Now they're settled in the land and they're living in the land and they have these judges, right? Well, there's a famine. In the, in the area where they're staying here, um, Naomi and Elimelech, and food is running scarce. So they decide, okay, we're going to leave. We're going to move out of here because the times are just, they've gotten too rough. We're going to choose to move. And it says that they went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Moab was one of the neighboring country, countries. It was a heathen land. They didn't, excuse me, they didn't believe on the Lord. There's always lots of wars and fighting and stuff between the children of Moab and the children of Israel, but they decide things aren't going well, so we're going to sojourn. That word sojourn, it means it's a temporary stay, right? We're just going to, we're not moving there to just like live there forever. We're just going to go sojourn there. We're going to wait it out. You know, things are going better over in that land. We'll be able to get some crops. You know, the economy's doing better. We're going to go live over there for a while. When things get back together in Israel, then we're going to, we're going to move back. That's what that word sojourn means. It's going to be temporary. And um, so that's what they do. There's this man, Elimelech, and his wife, Naomi, and, his, and their two sons. They go into this land, and Elimelech dies there. And then their two sons um, decide to marry wives of the, the, the children of Moab. And um, that's, see, that's another thing. Now, we see this event take place in verse number one, where they decide to leave the land of Israel. They've decided to leave God's promised land. We're going to get to that in a little bit. And we're going to see a lot of bad things start happening here. Um, the first thing is they, start, they took them wives of the land, which they weren't supposed to do. They weren't supposed to take the wives of, of, of the heathen lands. They were supposed to stay in their own land and, and, and marry um, 
marry wives of, of the children of Israel because, you know, especially back then, things were, um, the nations were split up and they had their own gods. And we see that later in this chapter. The, you know, the people, the, the people in the land of Moab, they didn't worship the Lord. They didn't worship God. They worshiped their own gods. And the reason why God had told them not to marry these wives of these other nations, these other strange nations, is because God chose a nation of Israel where he was going to reveal himself unto them. And that is, you know, that is, he was the real God, obviously. And there was nothing wrong with people from Moab or people from these other nations to come in and to become a part of Israel. That was encouraged. You know, that people were supposed to do that when they hear about the true God. Hey, come be a part of that and, and become a, a, basically like a citizen of Israel. And they can do that. And that, was, and that was encouraged for them to do that. But what they shouldn't have done was go out of the land, go out of God's promised land, and go out and marry other, you know, other women. Because then you start mixing the cultures together and you're bringing more of a sinful you know, heathen culture into your, your Christian culture, your, you know, the, the culture of God, which is why he didn't want them doing that. We're not supposed to be unequally yoked. So anyways, that's what happens though. The, these sons, they marry the, the, the women of Moab. And then it says they dwelt there about 10 years. Now, that's a long sojourn. Remember, they just went there to sojourn. They just went for, for a short stay. They weren't going there to live forever. They ended up being there for 10 years. That's a long time. And in those 10 years then, both of her sons die. So now Naomi is left with just her two daughters-in-law, right? Because... Because her husband died and then her sons died. So it's basically her and her two daughters-in-law. And it doesn't say anywhere that they had any children. So they, you know, they died childless. So now it's just these three women there. And she finds out, Naomi finds out that there's, you know, God visited the people. There's bread back in Israel. So she decides, well, I'm just going to move back home. I'm going to go back after 10 years. And um, her daughters-in-law were going to come with. And she basically tells them, you know, no, you know, I don't want you to come with me. And she goes on explaining, like, are you going to wait for me to have more children? Because that's what they did back then. It, when, uh, when, um, when a man would die and they were married, like a man and a wife were married, and when the husband would die, if they didn't have any children, it was the obligation or duty of, of that man's brother if he wasn't married, to take her to wife to raise up children unto his, his deceased brother's name. That's the, that's the way that, that they did it. That's what they were supposed to do. So um, because that was, that was the, the culture and that's what they did, you know, Naomi's explaining to him, well, wait, you know, like there aren't any more, she doesn't have any more sons for, for them to do that and to continue on and to raise up children unto their, to their husband's name. So she's like, even if I were to get married, she's like, I'm too old to get married. Right? She's an older woman. She's like, even if I were to get married tonight and have sons, she's like, are you really going to wait around until they're old enough for you to marry? You know, that's a long time. She was saying, basically, I'm grieved for you. You know, this is a bad situation. Why don't you just go back home? I'm going to go back to my country. You know, I appreciate the fact that you love me and you want to come with me, but just, just go back to your own country, to your own gods, you know, and, and, and find a husband and, you know, live out your life um, without worrying about me, is basically what she was saying. So one of them does that. She goes back. She says, okay. And, and she goes back to her country, but, but Ruth decides not to. She says, no, I'm coming with you. And she just vows to her, basically saying, look, where, where you go, I'm going to go. The, your people are going to be my people. Your God's going to be my God. She's like, nothing's going to separate us. She said, like, I'm going to be with you until you die. And that's a great level of dedication. That's a, that's a great thing that Ruth did of just saying, you know what? I'm just going to stick with you. I'm going to help you out. Because obviously she was an older wo widowed woman. So she is, she's going to have some hard times just trying to deal with things by herself. And Ruth noticed this and she said, no, you know, you're my family. We're gonna, I'm going to stick with you even though my husband's dead and your husband's dead. I'm going to stick with you and I'm going to help you out. So that's what they did. And that's what she did. And they end up going back to Bethlehem, which is where originally Naomi was from. And everybody sees her and, you know, and greets them. And Naomi basically says, why are you calling me Naomi? And she's like, the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. Call me Mara. And um, so that's basically that's what happens in this whole chapter. We read the whole chapter. Um, but what I want to 
what I want to point out here, there's a, there's a few, I think there's a few key um, points that I want to make here about, about what we can learn, lessons we can learn from this chapter, from this story. And there's a lot of symbolism here, so we're going to jump into this a little bit. Now, as I mentioned, you know, the hard times came, so Elimelech moves his family away. And now what are they moving away from? They're moving away from the promised land. This is a land that God had promised unto them. This is where God wanted them to be. This is God's will that they live in this land. And when hard times come up, when they start doing poorly financially, they decide to move into the heathen land. That was a mistake, and we see the repercussions of this. Um, they also moved away from their church. The tabernacle of God was in the land of Israel. It was, it was there that, that they would go and sacrifice and worship before the Lord and do all the things that they needed to do to serve God. That is where they were being taught from. That is where ch basically church was for them. They moved away from that. They moved away from the house of God. They moved away from the, from the promised land. And they, their plan was only to sojourn. They're like, well, we're only going to go for a little while. We're just, we're just going to be away from church for a little while. And what happens? A little while turned into 10 years. We could learn a lot from this. And um, you know that wasn't what was intended at all. It wasn't intended that Elimelech was going to die there and his two sons were going to end up dying there. They were just going to get a little financial relief. But their short stay turned into 10 years and all of this was a result, as a direct result of their decision making. The decision making that they made was to move away from God's land, to move away from God's people, to move away from church, to get out of that all based on essentially on money, on a financial decision, on a financial reason. Now, people today all over the country are, will, will receive job opportunities, right? You're going to get say, hey, I can get this job. In this, other, in this area, I'll have to move, but man, the money's going to be great. We'll be way better off. We can get a bigger house. We can get all this stuff. And people do that all the time. It's not uncommon. People are always picking up and moving in order to, to work at a better job. But here's the, the problem with that. And now, I don't think it's a sin to go and do that. There's nothing wrong with picking up and moving unless, unless you're moving away. Let's say the area we live in right now, you're going to a good church. You're, you're, you're plugged into a good church. You've got, you've got a great pastor. You've got a great church. You've got people who love God, who's serving God. And you get this offer, and it's going to be a lot of money. It's going to help you out, but there's no good church in that area we're going to move to. What's going to happen is essentially you're going to be doing the same thing that Elimelech ended up doing in this story. You're, saying, you're going to have your eyes focused on, well, like, I can make more money here. Let's move here. Let's go out of this place. I know there's no good place to, to, to serve God there. There's no, you know, there's no good church, but I'll make more money. And that is the wrong incentive. That is the wrong motivation that you should have to, is, just, is just how much money are you going to make? Because again, I, and I've covered this, this is such a key theme to the Bible and for our own lives is that the amount of money you make is nothing. It's nothing. It's not what this life is about at all. And we need to be careful never to get disillusioned by this or never to get, to get um, sucked into and deceived with the thoughts of, hey, I mean, maybe you'll make twice the amount of money and be like, man, how can I pass that up? I'll be making twice what I'm making right now. Well, if you're not going to have a good place to worship God, if you're not going to have a good church, or if you're not going to have anything that's going to help you out um, spiritually, and, and be around people that love God, I guarantee you, look, when people get out of church, you might have, you might take, you take the best Christian, you take someone who's on fire, serving God, doing what, you know, going out soul winning, reading their Bible, praying, doing everything that they need to do. You get that person out of church, you know what's going to start happening? They're going to start reading their Bible less. You know what's going to happen? They're going to stop soul winning. They're going to start getting into more sin. They're going to start being leaning. Look, it's, it happens. It happens to the best of us. It happens to the best people because when you're not around God's people, when you're not being edified, when you're not being comforted, when you're not being lifted up, when you're not around the same type of people in the same mindset, you're going to be out in the world. You're going to be around people that, that don't share the same faith that you have. You're going to be you know, spending all of your time. Now look, we all spend our time around people like that to a certain degree. You know, We all have jobs. 
or you know whatever most of us have jobs where we go out we deal with people you know you live in the world you have family friends whatever you have all kinds of different people that can influence you but that's all the more reason why we need to be rooted and planted in church in God's house to be around people who are like-minded that say no you know what I know there's these other influences out here but I'm not gonna let them bring me down because I'm going to strive to keep moving forward and I get encouragement from other people and the people that you spend the, the uh, time with and especially the most time with are going to have the biggest influence and impact on your life. Um, it's, it's a fact. If you just go out and spend all of your time around people who don't care about God and don't love God, that will rub off on you. Just as human beings, we have that nature where, where you kind of end up picking up a lot of habits and a lot of traits and, and a lot of sayings. Maybe you noticed before. I know when... Um, <laughs> this is a really funny example. Okay, I worked at a, in a hospital and I worked in the kitchen. I washed dishes and, and did, did that type of work, right? I worked on an assembly line for food and... Not a very great paying job, you know, but it was what it was. I was young and, and inexperienced and I needed to work. So I was working at this job and I worked with a lot of, with a lot of black people. And obviously I'm white and I talk like a white man, but with, with working in this area and, and, and working around a lot, of, a lot of black people and they talked like they were black. I mean, it's just <laughs> nothing wrong with saying that. They had a different way that they would communicate, different things that they would say. And, after a while of working there, it was funny because I started picking up a lot of the same things and the way that I talk would change a little bit. And it, it was amusing and, and I caught myself doing this. I'm like, man, did I really say that? You know? <laughs> But it, but it happens, and sometimes my friends would pick up on it, you know, because I'd be working, and I'd, and I'd get off work and go out and be like, what? Like, what did you say? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't care what color your skin is or whatever, but it's, it's just funny. Um, all that just to say, you know, the people you spend a lot of time with, and I don't spend a lot of time working. You know, I was, I was working a lot of hours. So I'm around these people, and it just, they just start rubbing off of me. And, I, and you know what? Probably some of my traits and some of the things that I said, you know, probably rubbed off on them too, on, on, on other people, my coworkers. It happens. I mean, things that, that, that my wife would say, you know, I end up saying a lot of the same things and she does it likewise. You know, when you spend a lot of time with someone, it just happens. You rub off on each other. And that's why it's so important to not get out of church. Because when you end up spending time around people, especially people who don't go to church, who don't love God, hey, the things that they're interested in, are not going to be godly righteous things. It's going to be, you know, maybe a lot of those people will be more interested in earning money or more, more interested in going out and partying and, and doing all of these different things, right? And, and it's not the, the, the focus that we should have. So when you get out of church, when you get out of God's house, that will end up bringing you down because if you're not spending your time around the right things around the right people in God's house and where God wants us to be, then you're going to be spending your time elsewhere. And those influences will come and they'll influence, influence you negatively. They'll bring you down. So, like I said, if you're in church and you're, you're on fire, you're serving God, you're doing all the right things, but you decide to leave and you, you, just, you just say, I'm getting out of church for whatever reason, whether it be you move away, whether, you know, for a job or for something else, and you get out of church, I've seen it happen too many times. It's a fact. You may be good for a little while, but the, the, the slow impact of not being in God's house and not being around God's people will impact you negatively to where you will stop serving God and, and be drastically reduced in, in how much you're doing for Him. And um, it's, it's a dangerous situation. We see a lot of bad things ended up happening to Ruth and to her, her family as a result of their decision to move away. They get out of God's will. They got out of... Now look, um, was it difficult? Sure. They came across difficult times. And it's not saying that, that when, you're, when you're doing the right thing and you're going to church and you're studying the Bible and you're praying and doing all these things, hey, hard times might come. They will come. We're going to suffer persecutions and tribulations and different bad things are going to happen, but that's not a reason to quit. It's not a reason to move away. It's not a reason to get out. We need to work through it. Um, now, we don't know exactly what happened to Naomi's husband or her sons in this story. It doesn't give us that detail. It just says that her husband died and then it says her children died. So we don't know, you're like, was it a freak accident? We have no idea what happened. 
we don't know how it happened and we don't know um, the actual cause either. Like um, it, the Bible doesn't say like God isn't saying that because you've sinned, I've taken away your husband and your children. But what we do have, and it's really important to note this, is that that's the way that Naomi attributes it to. Naomi's the wife, right? She's the one who had her husband, her husband died and her children died. Now, the author of the Bible, like, and here, okay, here's a real quick point. When you read the Bible, it's important to know this too. The Bible is true completely without error, without any problems. There's no contradictions in the Bible, but the Bible also records what people say, exactly like what, what words come out of people's mouths. So when it records what people say, what they said isn't always necessarily true. So, for example, in the, in the book of Matthew, when, it when we read about Jesus Christ being in the wilderness and he's tempted of Satan, and Satan is talking with Jesus Christ, well, Satan's words are recorded in the Bible. But the Bible says that there is no truth in him. He's a liar. He's a father of it. You know, Satan is darkness. He is not light. He, um, he speaks lies. But what's true is the fact that what Satan said is recorded. So like those are the words he said, even though his words aren't necessarily true. You know, he's not speaking the truth. So when we look at what Naomi said, Naomi is attributing everything that happened, basically, um, that God is afflicting her and that God is causing this stuff to happen to her. Um, so we can't, even though she's saying that maybe she's wrong, but she's probably not. She's pro I mean, she probably has a lot more insight in this. We don't gain all the insight that she has. Um, but she said, actually, in multiple times, at verse 13, she said, um, she said, would ye tarry for them till they were grown again? She's talking to her daughters-in-law, like, would you wait around for, for future children to be grown, to be married to? She said, would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. This is the first place she's saying, look, God's hand is against me, obviously, because she lost her children and her husband. And then in verse 20, she, she goes on even further when she makes it back to Israel. She says, and she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Again, attributing that God has dealt with her very, you very bitterly. This is something that, that God has inflicted on her. And then in verse 21, she says, I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So, in you know, many places here, Naomi is convinced. I mean, this is the judgment of God coming against her, and I believe that she's she's probably right. You know, even though these are her words, it's not God saying that; she's saying this. But the fact that that they left Israel. They went into the land of Moab, and then these bad things started to happen. I don't think that's a coincidence. And then you have Naomi saying, yeah, you know, God's judging me. God's afflicting me. You know, I went out full. And it's, and it's interesting how the mindset changes, right? When they were in the land of Israel, they left because of hard times, because of the famine. But she said that she was full. And she was full. She had her family. Now, Maybe they were struggling financially. Maybe it was hard to come food. Maybe hard times had come and, and they didn't have as much food as they'd like to eat. And it was very uncomfortable. And, but they had each other. They had their family. She had her husband. She had her sons. And then when she came home, she had none of that. Now there's bread in the land and things are great. But do you think, she would, do you think she's happier after coming back home without any of her family than she was before they left, even without very much? No way. And, um, and that's why I said she, she went out full. They had everything. And they came back empty because she got out of, of God's will. She left the promised land. They left, they left it, and, and the whole motivation was their finances. That's a bad, a bad reason to make decisions. Now look, if you're going to make a decision it's going to help your finances and it's not going to impact negatively you know, your walk with God or anything like that, then go ahead and do it. By all means, that's smart, right? There's nothing wrong with that. If, um, if you said, hey, man, I got a job, but it's in Phoenix. I'm not going to be able to make it up here to come to church. Well, hey, there's a great church down in, that, in the Phoenix area. Go ahead. It would, there's nothing wrong with going on, 
taking that job, making the more money, and still being able to serve God very well, right? I mean, it, it, and that's the thing. It, you, but you need to put your priorities first. What are your priorities? Are your priorities serving God and doing what's right first above making money, above all of these other things that you can do with your life? That should be where your, where your, um, where your focus is and what your priority is. Um, and, you know, you hear all the time about people moving for jobs, but not very often do you hear about people moving for a church. And think about it in the grand scheme of things, what's more important, the amount of money you make or, or, or how you serve God? Obviously, how you serve God is way more important. It makes a lot more sense for people to say, you know what, I'm going to move because there's this great church over there that I want to be a part of. That's going to help me to get on fire. That's going to help being around those people, man. I'm going to serve God so much better. I could do so much more with my life if because there's nothing here for me. You know, I try these other churches, but they're dead as a doornail. There's nothing going on. Nobody's doing any good works. They're not preaching right. You know, there are all kinds of false doctrine. Hey, it makes so much sense to go and move and, and be around other people that 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 believe the same way, where you could do more for God. It makes so much more sense to do that than it does to go get a job somewhere. Yet. The world will ridicule you for that. If you were to tell someone, yeah, I'm moving because, uh, because I want to go to church there, they'd be like, what? Are you crazy? You know, like, you've got a good job. Everything's going fine for you here. Why, why would you leave for church? It's like, why would I not leave for church? And um, it's, uh, it, it, it all boils down to your priority. See, these, these bad things ended up happening. When you get out of church, when you decide to just forsake God and forsake, forsake the assembling, Bad things will happen. You'll end up um, not doing what you ought to be doing for God. Now, um, all these statements that Naomi made about, you know, about God, you know, afflicting her and everything else, even if nothing else, this shows that these people did fear the Lord. This was a Christian family. This is a people who did believe in God. Um, the fact that Ruth came and dwelt with Naomi, even after her husband was dead, and choosing for the Lord to be her God and for choosing to be part of her people, you know, that was still a big impact made on her. And um, I believe that that family was, a, you know, they were a good family. They were a godly family. They just made a poor decision. You know, I don't think that these were in any way, you know, bad people that were just running away from God at all. Like, I don't think they were thinking that they were getting out of God's grace or, or, you know, getting out of church like that. I think they were just, they just made a foolish decision on, on, on planning on temporarily being away. And that's the thing, you know, a lot of times you got to be aware of this too because people say, oh, well, I'm starting a new job and that job requires me to work on Sundays and on Wednesdays, so I'm not going to be able to, to make it to church. But after a couple years, I could change my schedule and then... And then I'll be able to get back into church. Be very, 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 very careful. I would, I would never recommend anyone to make that decision because what's going to happen is over the course of that time, you're going to get used to working. You're going to be out of church for that time. You're going to start backsliding. And then who knows if you'll ever even get back into church. It's something that you, you know, the devil is always trying to, to drag people out of church. He does not want you doing better. He does not want you improving your life. He does not want you serving God. He does not want you winning souls to Christ. It happens time and time and time again. I've, I've been in church now for, for quite a while, and, and you see people, and you can see this, the small things start coming up. And, and people will start missing church for this reason, and then it's for this reason, and then it's for this reason. And pretty soon, before you know it, you're seeing them once a month, and then you're seeing them a couple times a year, and then you just don't see them anymore. And, and that's the way it works. You know, when, when, you, when you allow these other things to come up, when you don't have your priorities grounded and founded and say, you know what, I don't care what happens. And that was a decision I made for myself. I said, you know what, I am not going to miss church. I'm not going to miss church for work. I'm not going to miss church for, for anything unless I'm physically ill. You know, so, or, or some other major drastic event happens that's going to prevent, you know, obviously there's things happen and, and you get pulled out. But the decision that you got to make for yourself is how important is it to serve God? How important is it to, to go to church? How important is it to read your Bible? Uh, for example, if, if, um, if I haven't read my Bible all day and I come home and I'm really tired and really beat, hey, I'm still going to read my Bible. I'm going to make sure that I do that. And it's, uh, it's something that I do personally. Look, 
Make the decision for yourself. You need to decide how important is this to you, right? And, and for me, I'm not going to go a day without reading God's Word. Not one day of my life. I do not, not, from here on out, right? I mean, it's happened plenty of times in the past. But from here on out, this is a decision I made. I've made the decision I'm not going to let work or anything else keep me out of church because I, I put these priorities in my own life. And you need to do the same thing for yourself. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly the same things that I do or that other people do, but, but you need to decide what is important for you. And I'll tell you what, if, if you put church and serving God down on a low priority, it might as well just, just not exist because you, you'll end up... It's one of those things, you know, the Bible says that you cannot serve God and mammon. You, you kind of got to be all in or all out. God, does, God says in... Um, the Bible says in... in um, Revelation 3, uh, we're talking to the church at, um, wow, my brain just died. Laodicea, the church of Laodiceans, and he said that you're not cold or hot. He says, I would you were either cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, he's I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. He's like, I don't want to have anything to do with people who are just kind of half in, half out, you know, like kind of going to church thing, but kind of not. He's like, look, either get on fire, get in, get, you know, get things moving in your life or just get out. He's like, I don't, I don't like this, this, this indecision, this, this kind of wishy-washiness of being half in, half out. He's like, either get in, get on board, get moving or just get out. And, um, and ultimately that's what's going to happen. If, if, you know, you're either going to be in or out. If you start doing this wishy-washy thing, guess what? You're going to end up, you're going to end up falling out. Um, so anyways, I don't know how I got off on that, on that tangent a little bit, but um, this, was a, well, this was a good family, I believe. They're, they're probably a Christian family. You know, they made a poor decision, but it ended up costing them a lot. We need to have the faith to keep on doing right, especially when times are tough. So these, these people ended up making a, a poor decision to move because of the hard times, because of the affliction. The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse number 23, it says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. If you're doing what's right, if you're doing good things in God's eyes, your steps are going to be ordered by the Lord. That means He's going to lay out your steps for you. You don't always realize what they are. But if you just say, you know what? I'm going to read my Bible. Again. You know, I'm going to do what's right. I'm just going to, I'm going to live and try to do things that are right. God's going to direct your path for you. You don't have to worry about that. He's going to order them for you. It says, and He delighteth in His way. Though He fall... He shall not be utterly cast down. So are we going to stumble and fall sometimes? You bet. There's going to be times when, when things get rough, when we screw up, we make mistakes, you know, we're not doing everything perfect and we end up falling as a result of it. But he says, you know, a good man is not going to be utterly cast down. You're not just going to be down and out, right? You're not going to be down for the count. You're going to be able to get back up. It says, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. God's going to help you back up. God's going to keep you moving in the right direction. Um, he says, I have been young and now I'm old. So this is someone who's saying, look, I've been young already, now I'm old, and yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. This is important truth to note. And, and if Elimelech could have, could have, you know, he could have used this wisdom saying, look, if I'm going to do what's right, if I'm going to be righteous in God's eyes, and I'm going to do everything right, hey, this guy's saying, I have not seen the righteous begging bread. You may not have all the riches in the world. You may not be, you know, very affluent and, and have lots of money, but you're not going to be begging bread. God's going to make sure of that. God has promised to provide us with food and with clothing. Those are two things that God says that you will not go out without. So you can know and rest assured, as, as, as sure as God is true and God is not a liar, if you are doing what's right in His eyes, He will make sure you do not go hungry. So even if there's a famine in the land, even if we have some major disaster and, and for, you know, for whatever reason, there's no more food coming into the grocery stores. You know, maybe, maybe there's some natural disaster and, and the tr trucks are prevented from, from trucking in the food from all over the world and now we don't have a grocery store anymore. And now that would be like a famine in our days, right? It would be hard to come by food because the, 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 the food supply that we're used to receiving has been diminished or is gone. 
if you're doing what's right in God's eyes, he will make sure that you are not begging for bread. That's something that we can trust. And you may not be able to see that. You might have your judgment a little bit clouded and say, well, I don't see how that's possible. How could that happen if we're, you know, look, God will find a way. God will make it work. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be eating T-bones and, <laughs> you know, having, having all the most expensive stuff, but you're not going to be begging for bread. He'll, he'll at least provide that much for you. He says, he is ever merciful and lendeth and his seed is blessed. Okay, God will provide for us. And we need to maintain that type of faith. So even when the famine comes, even when the hard times come, look, God's going to take care of us with our needs. Not always our desires and our wants and, oh man, it'll be so nice to have this. No, with our needs. He's going to take care of us. He'll provide for us. He'll make sure because he doesn't want us to go out and do these. He doesn't want us to go out to the heathen. He doesn't want us to, to move away from him. Because of these hard times, he says, no, look, trust me. I'll take care of you. And think about your own children. If you lost your job, would you, um, would you say, well, kids, you got, you're going to need to go out and, and find your own work somewhere else? Because I know you're going you're gonna to do whatever you could to make sure that your kids can eat and, and, and have something. You would do whatever it took, right? God's going to take care of you as that young child. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna see us as his children and he'll make sure that you are at least fed and that you have clothing to cover yourself with. Um, and I'll tell you this, I would much rather be with God's people in a famine than with the world, even though I could have an abundance of riches. Even if I could be rich, but just be out in the world. Like, like if I could just get a mansion and live with the movie stars and the rock stars and, right, and live that lifestyle with them, I would not take that in a heart for a second. I would not even consider going and moving and living in Hollywood or wherever it is with the filthy, wicked trash that is in Hollywood and get away from God just to enjoy these pleasures of sin for a season, just to have a bunch of money. Not for a second. I'd much rather be poor and homeless among God's people people that love God and people are doing right and serving God with integrity of heart and doing that which is right, I'd much rather spend all of my time among that crowd and among those people and in those conditions than among the wickedness and, and even though you can have a lot of riches. The Bible says in Proverbs 15 verse 16, it says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Bible also says in Proverbs 16, 8, and I love this verse. I have this actually at my office at work. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. It's much, much better that you're doing the right thing, excuse me, that you're doing the right thing, that you are being righteous, that you're living a righteous life and have little. And just, just be satisfied with what you have. Just have that little bit than to have great revenue, you know, lots of riches and not be right with God. You know, and that's one of the reasons why I brought that to work is, is it's important, you know, we ought to be keeping ourselves honest, honest in our business, honest in God's eyes. You know, I'm, I'm dedicated not to, to do any type of shady business dealings or anything just because it may make us a bunch of money. I'm going to walk with integrity. And even if it means not getting as much money or if it means doing little or whatever, that's what I'm going to do. And that's the right thing to do. And that's what God expects us to do. You know, it's not all about money. Now, you, you might say, though, okay, well, what if I live in a wicked area? You know, God may judge that area, and, this, you know, I'll be punished as well. That happens. God's judgment, sometimes when, when, when a country or land gets really wicked, God's going to send his judgment, and it's going to come. And, and sometimes there's people, you know, that, that aren't quite that bad or whatever that, that you know, it's collateral damage, right? You're getting, you're getting stuck there. And that may be true. But the first thing that I would do, if, you, if you're worried about that, if you think, hey, this is going to happen to me, first thing I would do is analyze my own situation. I say, look, is there a good church in my area? And if there is, then make sure that you are as involved as possible with that church and doing everything right for yourself and, because, and within the church. Because if you have multiple people that love God and that want to serve God and you know, you're, you're doing the works and you're going out trying to reach people, uh, even a small group of people can have a large impact on a community. 
on an area where you can you can try to reach people with the gospel and 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 ultimately when you get through to individuals the overall wickedness should should start taking a back seat when 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 you start reaching more people with the gospel with the truth with God's word and they start making the changes in their own personal life it will have more of an effect on the community as a whole but you can't get too focused on on everything's real bad you got to say well what can i do i'm only one person i, I may have, i'm you know i might not be able to change the world you can't by yourself it's too big but what you can do, what you can do, is you can go out and you can have an influence on, on the amount of people that you can. And, and, and it's, but it's not something to ignore. See, the thing is, if, if you just think that, oh, this is too big for me, I can't, I can't handle all this, and then you quit, well, then now you're not doing any good at all. But if you just say, you know what, I know I can't save the world. I know I can't, I can't necessarily you know, change everybody's mind, but, but I might be able to change some people's minds. And you start doing that, and if everyone had that mindset, if at least everyone who's doing right and, and wanting to serve God did that mindset, we'd be reaching even more people. And um, you, you might not see it, it might take some time, but you can have a serious impact on a community by just putting your nose down and, and doing the work. Now, and that's what I would recommend for people who, you know, if you're living in an area and you say you're worried about God's judgment coming down and you're getting scared and you want to leave, hey, don't leave. Stick in the battle. Stick in the fight. Just, just keep doing that which is right and try to stay off the, the destruction by doing what's good. Now, let's say you live in an area you don't have a good church and nobody's there, you know, there's not really any godly people there. Now, I would strongly consider moving. Move somewhere where you can, you can at least meet with people who love God. And, but ultimately, again, even if maybe you're not able to move for whatever reason, no matter what you do, you need to individually serve the Lord and keep yourself unspotted from the world and trust that God will look out for you because if you are doing that which is right even if everybody around you is doing wrong God is still able to deliver you out of that turn to second Peter chapter number two right near the end of the Bible we're almost done second Peter chapter number two second Peter chapter two if, the, if you're going from the backwards from the end of the Bible you got Revelation and Jude and third and second and first John and then second Peter. Second Peter chapter two. We're gonna see how God's able to, to deliver his people out of destruction and make sure that they're not affected by it. Second Peter chapter two, look at verse number six. The Bible says, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Get this, verse 9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So here you have, he was the, basically like the only righteous man living in Sodom. He was righteous. He was saved. He was a man of God. Everybody else was wicked. And God was bringing judgment upon that area and upon that land. Obviously, he rained fire and brimstone down from heaven to destroy him. But what did he do? He made sure that Lot got out of there. He made sure that, that he put forth that effort and, and said, Lot, you, you need to get out of here because I'm going to judge this place. So the person who was righteous, who was, who was righteous in God's eyes, he was saved. God took care of him and got him out of that. And he could do the same thing for us. So even if we're in an area where it's really godly, where, or ungodly, excuse me, and out of control, wicked, hey, if you're doing that which is right, God is able to even protect you, even if the whole place around you is going to burn to the ground. He can make sure that you're protected. So we need to have that type of a faith, right? That's a faith that we need to have that even in the worst situations and the worst times we're going through, that we're going to do that which is right and God will look out for us. Now the last point I'm going to point out here is um, in verse 16 of Ruth 1. You don't need to turn there if you're in Second Peter, but it says, um, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where, where you thou lodgest, I will lodge. 
Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Ruth was a Moabitess. She was from Moab. She grew up in a heathen land, right? That's where she grew up. However, even in the worst circumstances, people can still end up living for God and doing right. Even though she grew up in a land where, where they had other gods. You know, I mean, think about today. And, you know, in Saudi Arabia or in any of these other places, people grow up and they grow up in a different religion. They have Islam. They have these other things. Well, look, that's not ideal. That is not the best place to grow up in, right? But as we're going to see it, as we get into this, 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 um, this book of Ruth, Ruth was a, was a great woman and she did a lot of great things for God. She was, she was a very godly woman. And it stems from, from this, from her say, you know, being able to just say, you know what? Thy people shall be my people, and thy God is going to be my God. She was willing to say, you know what? I grew up in this land, and it is. It's a heathen land. And I'm going to go and be part of your people, and I'm going to serve your God, the Lord, the true God. And I'm going to get, you know, um, do that which is right in his eyes. And that's exactly what she did. She ends up playing a very important role in history. In, his, in history, she's, she's got an entire book of the Bible with her name on it, the book of Ruth, which is what we're studying. It's four chapters long, but can you imagine if your name, if, if what you did, if, if you, know, you had a book of the Bible dedicated to you, God's Word dedicated to you, that is quite an honor. That is, that is amazing, to, to, a great testimony for this woman that there is a story in the Bible and it's the book of Ruth. And it's, all, it's about her and about what she did. And she was a Moabitess. She grew up in a heathen land. She didn't have all the advantages. She didn't grow up in a Christian home. Yet she was able to do... She, she got right and got on board with God and lived a righteous life. She was very faithful. She was selfless. She was giving up her opportunity to go... out Because it would be lawful for her to go out and get another husband. Right? I mean, if her husband's dead... She's, she's no longer married. Hey, she's, she could easily go out and get another husband, have some children, you know, and live her life. She was selfless, though. She was willing to just, just put that aside and, and, and willing to give that up, even though she does end up getting married. She's willing to give that up and say, no, I'm going to take care of my mother-in-law. She's a widow. She's got no one to look out for. I'm going to do what's right, and I'm going to stick by her. She was selfless in taking care of her, and her faith was in the Lord. She had her faith in God. And we'll see what a good and hard worker she was as well as we get into the later chapters. Very godly woman. She handles herself well and, and ends up playing an important role of her. She is basically a progenitor of um, King David and ultimately in the line of Jesus Christ. She's in that line. Um, but we'll, see, we'll get it more into that as we get um, further into this book. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you for this, for this great book of Ruth, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to learn a lot as we go through this book, dear God. And I pray that you would please just help us all to have, have faith, never to get out of church, dear God, and away from your people and away from serving you. Help us to stay strong and steadfast, dear Lord. Help us not to be deceived by the riches of this world and not to, to make that our number one priority, but make serving you our number one priority, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just bless everyone that's here tonight. Lord, help us all individually to get closer to you. Help us all individually to start making the changes that are necessary in our lives, that we can draw closer to you and that you can look at us and say that, that we are walking upright and that you can be proud of us for the work that we're doing for you, dear God, and that we can just rest assured that you, you've promised to take care of us. And even in our worst situations, Lord, we know that you will take care of us as your children. And we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.